This is Fight Fans Radio. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's May 21st. We're uh, live on another episode of Beach Jadic Radio, unless you're listening to it on YouTube or one of your apps on your Androids, and then it's not live. But either way, right now it's May 21st, 7 p.m., and uh, we got a big show kicking off tonight. We got Brian Simmons. Uh, you know, he uh, is a person that uh, is behind Grappler's Quest, which is one of the the premier uh, grappling leagues and uh, has groomed a lot of people in the community to become uh, major superstars. And, uh, uh, you know, the Mike Fall, Jeff Glover, Ryan Hall, all these people came through uh, Grappler's Quest. And uh, so I don't want to ruin too much. He's got a lot of lot of big things coming up. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk over that uh, this whole episode and uh thanks everyone for tuning in to last week's uh chris brennan the west side strangler it, it was a great episode and the one before that mike fallers of course if you guys missed any of those uh just subscribe to our uh youtube either uh bjj attic tv uh fight fans radio they have all ours uh they produce the show uh and and they have a lot of other shows uh underneath them so go check out fight fans radio uh, they do a lot of great work, and uh, they're out here just like us, hustling uh, day in, day out, uh, trying to provide people with some great content and something to listen to. So if you're a fan of these type of shows, uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the other ones. And, uh, yeah, so thanks so far, everyone, for the support. Our numbers keep growing, and uh, so does our fan base. And if you're like me, guys, you've been keeping an eye on uh, next week uh, for the Worlds is happening Uh IBJJF, huge, huge uh, tournament uh, that begins, of course, next week. Uh, starts May 29th, so that's eight days away, and it goes between then, 30th, 31st, June 1st, and June 2nd in Long Beach at the Pyramid. Uh, you know, I checked it out. Everyone's like, oh, you know, I was kind of in the mix. Oh, going crazy seeing the the list of competitors and uh, I saw Keenan wasn't on there but I just got off uh, Twitter and uh, I talked with uh, Galveo Mr. Andre Galveo that is leader of autos and he confirmed that uh, Keenan Cornelius is indeed uh, competing at the Worlds uh, next weekend and uh, I'm not gonna lie I was kind of worried that he wasn't in the mix and uh, kind of let down. I was like, ah, oh, man, because, you know, I want him to double grand slam. I'm really rooting for him. And if you guys have been keeping an eye on Keenan, then you know right now that uh, he has a lot of his uh, videos getting released lately for his uh, DVD that he is uh, making. So it's pretty awesome. I've seen his patented arm bar from 5050. Uh, also, he has a uh, back choke. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I saw some people's comments, but there's always people uh, hating on stuff, so that's okay. But, uh, you know, just because he's King Cornelius doesn't mean he's going to whip out a move and uh, it's going to never be seen before or uh, it's going to be a magic move. Uh, you know, his jujitsu is actually good. Uh, yeah, solid fundamentals, obviously, still. And uh, people expect the. Uh, you know, some of these modern uh, competitors to do some, you know, unorthodox shit to get a choke. But, uh, you know, he showed that uh, solid skills. And it's the way they do it that's different than uh, others, right? You could see that same choke. I've seen it 20, 30 times. And uh, he had really good, clear instruction. And uh, it really made sense when I watched Keenan's uh, version. And, uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to be one of the first people to purchase his DVD, so I'm excited for that. Uh, coming out very soon, I believe he had a release date. Uh, I just can't find that at the moment. So we have that going on. Uh, of course, 
this weekend past, we had the UFC, and I'm not going to talk about every fight, but I will talk about uh, Jacques Array for a second, uh, Ronaldo Zouza, uh, former Strike Force champion. Uh, man, he did the most motions I've ever seen in MMA, and it was phenomenal. I was losing it watching the fight. I'm sure anyone else was watching it. Uh, they were probably going crazy also. The transitions. Uh, man, high level is not even a word for him. Uh, hits the arm triangle and puts him to sleep. I've never seen somebody go to sleep faster than that. It was unbelievable. And then the main event... Uh, you know, Belfort comes out, and I'm sorry if I'm ruining this for people. Belfort comes out, and, and he throws a spinning kick and just lands it. And, uh, man, I, I feel weird saying this now, or not weird, but, uh, you know, in hindsight. You know, I called Luke Rockhold for a W. He was looking like an unstoppable man in strike force as the champ. And it, it kind of weird, you know, the way the, the deck shuffles or the rankings go. You know, you got a guy like uh, Vitor... He's right at the top. You got uh, Jacques Ray now right up there. And, and Luke Rockhold falls somewhere uh, a little bit lower on, on the list. So uh, the 185 division just overnight is looking pretty solid. Uh, again, I hope uh, personally that Belfort doesn't get another title shot right away. I still think there's some guys out there that uh, I think a couple more fights would be good. And uh, yeah, man, that, that's all about that pay-per-view it wasn't a pay-per-view, uh, sorry, FX8. The event was really cool. Um, I enjoyed those two fights at the end. It, uh, the crowd was insane, as usual. The Brazilian fans were amazing. Uh, really, really could hear it through uh, the speakers. So they, they seemed like they were losing it. Of course, this week, uh, coming up, uh, the long weekend in America, we got uh, the big event going on. We got... Cain Velasquez and Antonio Bigfoot Silva. You got uh, JDS and uh, Mark Hunt. Uh, you got... I'm trying to think off the top of my head. You got uh, James Tejuna and Glover Texera. You got the Donald Cerrone and KJ Nunes. And you got the lightweight, uh, the 155 title elimination fight between TJ Grant and uh, Gray Maynard. And, uh, you know, hopefully the UFC follows through with this one and, and it's actually a title elimination fight. I think we've heard this probably for the last three years that, you know, this is a title elimination fight and no one's got a title shot. Uh, it's whoever talks the most shit or could uh, get the most fans via controversy. So these two people just go out, bust their ass. They don't talk much. And uh, I really hope one of them actually gets a title shot for the win. Of course, myself and 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 most of us were rooting for uh, T.J. Grant. Uh, that's just me being biased, me being Canadian. And I actually like T.J. a lot. I've seen him fight live like six, seven, eight times. Huge fan of his for uh, for actually a long time now. I seen him first fight probably in 06, and uh, he I thought he was solid back then, and, and he's only been getting better. So good luck to TJ this weekend coming up, and uh, there's a lot of good fights on this card actually that I'm I'm pretty pumped for. Quick uh, water break. Hold on one second. All right, it was a long water break. I lied. Sorry. It's weird when I don't have my boy Jeroel P with me. He is uh, currently training on Tuesday night, so we all support him. He'll be back for the June 4th episode, which will uh, feature none other than Stefan Kesting. And if you don't know who he is, uh, use your little Google tube. Use YouTube and use Google and, and check this man out, Grapple Arts. Uh, he was one of the first, I'm not going to say the first, but he was one of the first people to put out instructional DVDs uh, with Dennis Kang. Uh, I bet you a lot of people don't know that, and a lot of people don't know. He actually had a GSP uh, instructional for MMA uh, with GSP. So he 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 got on GSP before 
he was even GSP. This guy was just knocking people out out in the TKO, which is uh, not around no more, but definitely anybody out in Montreal area and and uh, any outskirts of that really remember uh, TKO and have fond memories if you ever got to go to the uh, events. Uh, man, they were they were they were great. So, uh, but yeah, so those events were pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, so Stefan Kesson's on. And I think it's about time we call uh, Brian Simmons. Uh, let's start this interview, everyone. And uh, thanks for listening to me rant. And uh, I'm ready to rock and roll. Hello, may I speak to Brian, please? Speaking. Hi, Brian. You're live on BJJ Radio. How's it going? Thanks for having me. No problem. I'm uh, the host, David Carroll. So uh, there's only one of us. So are uh, you ready to start this off? Absolutely. Perfect. Uh, before we get into the, uh, the tip questions, uh, can you just run through maybe what you've been up to today? Because uh, I'd like to know what a typical day is for uh, someone like yourself. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, today, we I'm working on I'm working on a project uh, to do the first uh, song fundraiser song in uh, for autism in Spanish. So I launched that today. That was my our, our charity project with AutismRadio.org. Um, today was uh, confirming everything with Pel, uh, Kurt Pellegrino with all of our travel information. We're flying out together. Um, for confirming him for the big super fight and seminar this weekend in Canada. Um, I was actually home with my children today because they were sick. So I was right now is actually my time. I actually hired a babysitter tonight to come out and be able to be able to focus not having kids screaming in the background. So. <laughs> uh, much appreciated. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate being on here. Ah, what you likewise. Doing. Let Let's start off with. Uh, We'll get into your background, but let's start off with this event coming up uh, this weekend uh, for Brampton. Let's get on to this one. It's uh, Saturday, May 25th and 26th. Yes, uh, Saturday, May 25th, 26th. Um, it is a, it's an all-weekend show. Uh, Grappler's Quest, the Gi and No Gi is on Saturday. And then on Sunday, they have Amateur Mixed Martial Arts and Pancration and the Canadian National uh, Team Qualifier going on Sunday, plus the Kurt Pellegrino Seminar, which is 12 to 2 p.m. It's his first seminar ever in Canada. So Kurt's uh, coming out and supporting the event in a big way. We're very excited. He's obviously doing a huge super fight on Saturday. Uh, you know, Kurt Batman Pellegrino is he's a nine-time UFC veteran, uh, fought in Bellator, and he's a defending undefeated Grappler's Quest super fight champion. So he's nice. coming. He's he's coming to challenge uh, Toronto BJJ's head instructor George Brito. And are you uh, allowed to make ten... picks, by the way? Here, say that again. Are you allowed to make picks on these uh, fights? You know, do, do you have I, your money I, on anyone? I look at a, I would. I, you know, I usually do kind of like a sealed thing, and I give it to I give it to either my wife or something before. I just I I don't. It kind of puts a weird us in a weird position like you're i'm a like the fan of that's why i do the super fights not because mm -hmm. they make millions of dollars <laughs> they you know they cost they cost you know we love it we love watching it the fans love watching it we love making super fights that people um dream about you know like happen and we've been doing it since 1998 so i, I you know i'm i was big i thought it was also to give the super fighter and the person who either is in mixed martial arts or now retired or whatever it is and, and wanted to, to showcase them. And they deserve the spotlight like any other sport. You know, it's a special, you know, big name marquee match deserves the, the world stage. 
Nice. I, so, I think it's personally a great matchup. When I saw it announced, I was really excited. Uh, me being a, a Canadian, I'm biased. I'm going to go for uh, Toronto's uh, George Brito, though. But I'm, I'm a huge Batman fan, as I'm sure everyone is listening. But I, I'm going to go with uh, Brito. Right on. I, I, he's, listen, I mean, you know, Kurt said it to me. He's like, Brian, you didn't tell me he was like a world champion and all this stuff. You just, I was like, well, you know, he, he did the research. And he's like, this is, you know, Marcelo, Marcelo went the distance with him. He's like, Brian, come on. Marcelo, you know, submitted me. He's like, I think about stuff like that. So uh, he, he knows how tough of an opponent George Brito is. And the rules change up everybody's style. Uh, we instituted last year uh, the first, the submission only. Uh, round a tenant submission roll only round for super fights, and then if there's no you know if there's no submission in the ten minutes, it goes to a five minute grappler's quest round um, just to determine the winner. And uh, you know we've had we had some great success in that. Um, you know it changed uh, that you if anybody's a YouTube fan of the Grappler's Quest channel, it has like 13 million views. It's insane. Um, it's uh, livegrappling.com, but basically they um, you know, we had the the fight, uh, Bill Cooper versus Marcel Mafra, and if you watch that match, that's like a great example of how in ten minutes with no points, the guys couldn't submit each other, and then you saw when Cooper, Bill Cooper, was down on points in the overtime period because he couldn't submit him in the regular round, he was down on points, got a little bit desperate because he could not win. By, by a point at that moment, and he just went for a leg lock with 30 seconds left. So, you know, you get it – it's, it's kind of cool. You know, it, it's, it's cool to see it can move – it moves the, um, the intensity needle a little bit. And, and changing up the rules to make it a better, like a, a TV-friendly sport so it, it, somebody can understand, like, that guy's trying to submit that guy. And, you know, how did he get two points for that? How did he get two points for that? It's, it kind of waters down with the concept of the goal the the sport is. So we thought the submission only was another exciting element. It definitely proved it there at UFC Fan Expo. And uh, we you know we brought it into 2013 to get it running and get everybody excited about the future of grappling on television and Grappler's Quest being. I, I still dream about it. We have we're going to be a, it's going to be a hundred thousand dollar tournament on ESPN. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a 16-man tournament over a four-week or six-week period. I dream about stuff like that. It doesn't get much bigger than that. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, On this event, you also added a uh, a co-main event super fight. So that just popped up out of nowhere. And I'm not going to lie. Everyone knows listening to the show, I'm a huge Darson Hemmings fan. Uh, I think he's one of Canada's best right now. Uh, he might be the best, and he's fighting. I'm bad with names. I'm not even gonna try to say this guy's name. It's okay, uh, Mike Palladino. He, uh, right. Mike, Mike is a uh, very, very high level guy that got refereeing very young in his career for Grappler's Quest. So he started refereeing, and he would only compete every once in a while. But almost every single time he, he competed, he won his whole division, won the whole tournament, including UFC Fan Expos and Grappler's Quest U.S. Nationals. Uh, but he was traveling with with me and working so much. Um, I, I kind of wanted to give him an opportunity. He's won a lot of big USA tournaments for for us and for other organizations, um, and I thought he deserved a shot. You know, it's a we to do a USA versus Canada um, match. You know, no one wants to fight Darson. There's something people are. You know, I don't know. I you know, I think he's really talented. I don't think anybody should be afraid of somebody. Like you know, it's it's silly. It's silly. And when I when I heard how many people were, you know, not willing to t- take the match against him, I was I was a little shocked. So this is kind of a this is a, was a challenge to to me to find somebody that could take him on, that could really give him a run for his money, and who doesn't have a ton of footage out there of him. So it's gonna be a little bit of a shock. You know, there's a lot of when you're a guy that has a lot of your footage out there, it's harder. You know. Oh, People absolutely. Learn, I agree with you. Yeah, Darson has an abundance of, of footage out there. Um, moving on, uh, I'll ask a bunch of different questions after, but let, let's just go through some of the, the upcoming events. Uh, 
you know, after this big event, you got this huge one coming up in Las Vegas, July 5th and 6th. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this one? Yes, yes. I'm super excited. UFC Fan Expo, uh, we are doing uh, – we have, we've, it's our fourth year, consecutive year with the UFC since inception. Uh, it's been a huge success. I mean, the events are growing massively in size. You're getting, you know, grappling in front of, you know, 30 to 50, 60,000 people in a day that cycle through this event, and they're seeing grappling for the first time. So we're one of the marquee, we're definitely the marquee, you know, event of the, of, in the sense of attendance. It's awesome. It's like a huge draw, you know, five, 6,000 people. I'm sitting in that area watching the event all day. Um, and what we have, we've set up, we have 300 amateur divisions in no-gi submission grappling and then in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And we also have a couple bonus uh, throw, uh, judo throwdown tournament and uh, a wrestling takedown tournament that we added as well. But uh, basically, it's, you know, an amateur tournament over two days. On Friday, uh, Friday, July 5th, we have the no-gi submission grappling divisions for adults. Uh, it's a big tournament because of how many competitors we get. Uh, so we just have a no-gi on Friday for adults, and then uh, and then there'll be the first round of the four-man tournament, which we've assembled, which is called the Ultimate Grappler, uh, nicknamed and coined the Ultimate Grappler. It's going to be the four, four-man tournament, and two of the athletes already entered the tournament are Dean Lister, who everyone knows in, gra- in the grappling world, and if you haven't, uh, you've been under a rock probably. Um, but he's, you know, he, he actually just won his super fight last year, um, at UFC Fan Expo as well, and he beat uh, Ricardo uh, Demente Abreu, so it was a huge, huge victory for him. And he wanted to challenge himself in this four-man tournament, and uh, Joao Assis jumped in as well. So yeah, that's we got crazy. Two of the world, I'm so excited. Two of the world's best ready, and we have a lot of other guys, like really super high-level guys that are interested, guys from the UFC. Uh, all of our matchups, obviously, we got to get things approved with the UFC with working with them and make sure there's no conflict of interest, but um, they're they're pretty. The UFC is awesome that they support grappling so much, and they you know they're they're supporting a brand. They're supporting Grappler's Quest. It's not like they just went out and did their own event and you know did their own grappling tournament and tried to push somebody out of business. They actually supported us and have been very supportive to us to help build our brand and you know to make the Grappler's Quest brand more well known throughout the world. So we got a lot of respect for Zufa and the UFC and UFC Fan Expo for supporting grappling. And Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and they and they also added wrestling. So I mean, it's it's cool, you know. They they get it. They understand that we are a part of the sport, and we're not just some you know sideshow. We're part of it. So they made us part of it, and uh, we're you know it's, we're very proud and honored to be working with them fourth year in a row, and you know getting them started in the grappling world. So it's exciting. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. It, it's pretty amazing. Uh, there's is it is it just me? Or is there something a little bit more special? when these grapplers quests are attached to the, the UFCs? I mean, it's, it, the thing is, it's a beautiful, you know, people, people that were especially trying to cross over and get into mixed martial arts. It's, it's the pinnacle of the sport in mixed martial arts. So people want to be competing. They want to have a title that's associated with that. They want, you know, it's, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. We have guys from come from all over the world to compete in the UFC Fan Expo just to win that title. We only we custom mint medals um, that are you know these octagon medals. We don't do that for any other event. Um, you know we're, we're very we're very particular. The awards are these beautiful glass um, sculpted um, octagon awards for all the advanced divisions, and you don't get those in any other tournament where the only, you know it's the only event in the UFC you know makes it happen. So it's it's pretty awesome. You know, they're they're supporting it like that and giving these people, you know, these amazing athletes who dedicate so much of their time a showcase to be in Mandalay Bay. I mean, do you imagine being a kid and saying I competed in Mandalay Bay? People are like, what? You know, you didn't. Brock Lesnar fought last night at the UFC. You're like, no, I fought in the same venue <laughs> as they did. It's kind of neat, you know. Oh, absolutely, it's unreal. Uh, yeah. I've been keeping up with uh, Grappler's Quest. Always a huge. Uh, fan of what you guys are doing and i was just wondering i saw that there was a grapplers quest amsterdam coming up and i'm just wondering how you uh got a tournament running up in uh europe first of all oh uh, well we we actually sponsored we sponsored a an event um yeah, we sponsored the the grab and pull and their series of events 
And uh, so basically it's it grab and grab and pull is our partner and they're going to be run. They run the event out there. Um, and we, we are the co-sponsor uh, of the event and we, you know, we're working it out. So again, the, we're going to be able to take an American team to Europe, to Europe in 2013. We're going to crown uh, an American team on July 20th at the U S nationals in Morristown, New Jersey. And, you know, our goal is to be able to take the USA team throughout the world. And I want, I want to get, give them an opportunity to where they're able to win something and then go defend that title um, against the best in the world starting in Europe in 2013. So it's a lot of big things around the way. Um, you know, when you open up the world and you're able to work with, you know, other, other partners and other people out there that are like-minded and, honest and you know like it's important you know you need to be you need that when you're trusting somebody with your brand internationally it's a it's a big uh it's a big set you know big thing so for us to be able to expand out there and 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 you know working on clothing international clothing deals it's it's a really it's what what the brand needed uh the expansion the exposure is is necessary it's warranted we're in major demand so like we we went to Canada and and we got a new distributor in Canada, and you know he told me that as the takedown distribution guy, they said that the you know the phone's already ringing off the hook that people want the gear because they don't get stuff like this. So other countries are are looking to get you know DVDs and their and and their uh, fight wear, and they're looking for tournaments as well. So I think I think it's just time you know we built a, a very strong brand in 15 years. And it's just time to you know let let it fly, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Fifteen years ago, did you imagine anything uh, like this, or did you always have uh, the expansion and growth in your head? And, and this is just another step to getting even further than than what we think uh, is possible at the moment. Well, I always thought I always knew it would be on television. And we got, you know, we got the first, you know, national television deal with Fight Now. And I look at Fight Now as like the UFC looks at Spike, you know, and I stayed very loyal to Fight Now. And they're, I think they're going to be doing some really big things. So I, I could see, and when I saw that, that potential, and I started seeing like, wow, like we could get, I always knew it would be on TV. I always knew it would have a live show. Um I didn't know it would be as hard, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you that. I didn't know it'd be, it'd be this trying, um, but I don't think anyone ever does when they, when they set out. If it was easy, everybody would do it, and people try to do it, and they fail all the time, and I feel bad when people just think that it's just easy and just throwing mats down and, and running a, a financially successful event. You know, it's, it's hard, and you got people in this, in this economy that are, you know, people are struggling right now, so – and we work on discount programs and family programs because you got to. People need people need help because we want we want to have people come. We have volunteer opportunities or people you know that people that if they want to compete, there's always a way. One of my first martial arts instructors always told me that you know there's always you know it's not the grading at all. It's not people feel like oh I don't. If you feel weird about helping you know mop up the mats to pay for your your martial arts training there's something wrong with your, you know, with your priorities because if either you do it or you can't, you know, and people need help. Like we, we have, we have volunteers that help us all the time, work tables in exchange to compete. That's the way the sport works. People get, they get the benefit of, you know, competing for free. And then in turn, they're turning back and they're helping the event and the success of the event. And I like that. That's how, when it felt good when the sport was like that. And, uh, you know, people are, I think that that's where the success lies in the community and the community supporting each other. Nice. Uh, can you can you recall maybe give us a glimpse uh, the first event where it was and uh, was there any people that are famous in the grappling or fight world now that were actually competing at this uh, first event? Yeah. Uh, well, the first I, I run a bunch of shows starting in like 1996, 1997, uh, just like small little events inside schools. But the first uh, branded Grappler's Quest was uh, Saturday, April 24th. Of Hello. Hello.
You've reached 973-767-3119. Please leave his number out. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll be back in one second with him. Uh, he'll describe uh, uh, the first Grappler's Quest. Uh, yeah, so don't worry. He'll be back. Um, there's disconnected by accident. And uh, that's it. So we'll just get ready to talk to him in a splitty. That means split second in my country. You've reached 973. Hopefully his phone didn't die. That'd be one of those awkward situations. I'll tell you that much. If his phone did die, folks, I'll make sure that he all gives us free entry to Grappler's Quest. Nah, I'm just kidding. I don't have that type of power. Although it would be pretty sweet, eh? Uh, would it be worth this interview being ruined? Hmm. Perhaps. I don't know, though. So this is the first time, well, not the first time we've lost connection, but if his phone died, it, it's definitely might be the first time, considering uh, how horrible it is that his kids are sick right now. He got a babysitter to take care of them. So let's hope that his phone didn't die and this interview goes through. You've reached nine. Oh, God, folks. Lord baby Jesus. In my head right now, I visualize this man running. Hopefully, he has a charger with him. So he's running right now with a charger. He's plugging in the phone. He's screaming, cursing, taking BJJ Addict's name in vain. And uh, it usually takes a couple minutes for your phone to get that, uh, to turn back on first of all. So uh, we'll give him two and a half minutes because I know how long it takes. Two and a half minutes, and uh, then it'll come back on. So for those that don't uh, follow much for this type of stuff, you can go to Grappler's Quest. That's G-R-A-P-P-L-E-R-S-Q-U-E-S-T.com, and that's how you could sign up for all the tournaments and the upcoming uh, seminar with uh, Kurt Pellegrino. They have the store... Uh, they have the banners where it shows you where they're on TV for Fight Now. Uh, they have shorts. I already said that. They have all the news coming up. You have tickets. You can find out how you can sponsor. Uh, you can join their mailing list. They have lots of videos on YouTube. Uh, anyways, they're one of the, the most popular grappling uh, companies out there. There are a lot popping up, like he said, and uh, I, I agree with them. It's not an easy thing to do. And some people have been doing it successfully lately, uh, you know, and, and and hopefully they just carve their own lane because Grapple's Quest is pretty unique, uh, pretty awesome. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what's going on there. What other events are happening, folks? Yeah, man, it's crazy. Grapple's Quest Amsterdam. Uh, that's in August tenth. So if anyone's traveling to Europe or uh, lives in Europe and listening right now. I think that'd be a cool uh, thing to see. And yeah. All right, folks, for the people listening right now, You've reached them, uh, this does not look good at the moment. So I'll just keep talking, 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 talking. So for the people listening right now, or if you're listening after, uh, BJJ Addict. TV at gmail.com is the way to reach us. Uh, we're more than welcome to uh, speak with you guys if you're interested in sponsoring the show. Uh, we have uh, a couple options available for people. So if you just uh, email us, we could send you a package with uh, more information. And also, uh, obviously, BJ Attic, uh, the other side of the company, which does interviews and videos. Uh, Check us out on YouTube. We do a lot. Uh, if people want to sponsor that also, mm, people want to sponsor Fight Fans Radio, hit us up and check out them and hit them up. Either way, folks, this is all ran by uh, right out, out, no money, no money in, no money out type company. We uh, just do it for the love. So if people want to get out, 
sponsorship uh, bargain. We're we're all for that. We just want to spread uh, our show to the masses, get as many people listening, and if that could uh, help your company out, and then meanwhile it returns us with some more fans, that'd be excellent. We love to uh, work with people, so let's get a little network going and uh, spread uh, the art of jujitsu. Jujitsu. So, hmm. We're going to try again in uh, one more minute or two more minutes. Hopefully, that'll give enough time for his uh, phone to be charged or something like that. So, let's just listen to me rabble on a bit more about nonsense and uh, be jujetic, basically. So, for anyone out there, if you guys can hit on YouTube, go just type in be jujetic. You'll see our channel. And uh, we had a great interview and a great, I mean great. I'm not even trying to lie right now and just say it because uh, my boy at Subtext Management did it for us. But it is literally one of the best instructional uh, techniques out there. If you guys check out the video, it's Jake McKenzie showing a spin bar, we call it. If you guys check this out and you don't think it is uh, one of the, the best techniques you saw, then then fine. But uh, trust me, when you watch this video, it's shot beautifully. There's some hip hop beats. Mostly our videos have some like heavy rock. Uh, but right, there's some hip hop instrumentals. And uh, overall, it's like a, a pretty wicked, uh, pretty wicked video. So <sighs> check that out, guys. Let, let's give him a shout once more. If we can't get a hold of him. Uh, we're gonna don't know what to do here. Okay, his phone should be on, folks. So, hey, ah, what's up? <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. I I was sitting in the Toys R Us parking lot. And I pulled away and realized I pulled my phone out, <laughs> so I wasn't charging it. <laughs> no problem. It's all good. Uh, we actually blurred out the place you're at, and uh, we're selling it for 50 bucks. So any uh, company wants to know where he was sitting at to talk on this radio show, uh, hit us up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so always trying to sell. All right. So, yeah, first event was – we, and then you cut out. We don't even know where it yeah. was. Yes, it was uh, Saturday, April April twenty fourth of nineteen ninety eight, and we had uh, Ricardo Almeida was the first super fighter ever. Wow! And he fought uh, this Russian guy named Jerry. I forget his last name. Jerry was from Tai Kai Jiu Jitsu, and then we had uh, Ken Cronenberg from Tai Kai Jiu Jitsu do a super fight against this guy Robert Pritchett who was an Olympic alternate for wrestling. So the, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. It was an inter interesting start. And there was actually, you know, it was Henzo Gracie was there. It was, you know, it was Ricardo's first tournament ever in America. So it was, you know, a lot of famous guys actually that, that actually went on, went on to compete. You know, I mean, it's just, it's so, it, it's so amazing when I look back and I go back to Vegas and look at the old footage from, 2000, and I see, you know, D, you know Diego Sanchez and Keith Jardine. I mean, all the, the Jacksons guys, um, you know, Forrest Griffin. All these guys were competing, and Eddie Bravo were competing in these tournaments, and it was just such chaos. And I was running around like crazy that I didn't even get to fully even realize that these all these superstars were in it back in the day. So, um, you know, getting free and being able to have a little more space and having a better staff helping me allowed me to be able to showcase some of the people and getting a great, getting a great camera crew and doing all the, the, you know, this promotion that a promoter, a real promoter of a sport should do, which is showcase the athletes, you know, try to get the sport on TV and try to get big sponsors so they can give away great prizes. So, so I've been doing yeah. it. I mean, you're talking 1998, you said, uh, is is there ever a point like even right now it, it's not even uh as big as you would think it would be considering how popular MMA is is there ever a point coming up you were like what the hell why don't people get it or were you were you ever on the verge of just giving it all up no i would say 
for me, I, I was more, you get, at times you get discouraged by sponsors and sponsors that don't see the long-term vision and, you know, they're just looking at like the turnaround for each event, for example. They'll say, hey, if I spend, you know, the X dollars, I need to make X buck at that show. And not really, I think it's more of a frustration with the strategy of a lot of these marketing companies that represent some of these major brands. I don't think they're actually doing the job that they really could be. I think they're missing out on a lot of fringe brand, you know, not brands, but like sports, other sports. Uh, they'll go spend a million dollars on, you know, whatever, five, two, three million dollars for a space jump. You know, it's, that's cool, and that was that worked, and that's that it was great for exposure. But did it really help anything? You know, did it help? Will that ever be done again? Will anyone care? No. And that's where I think that's where sponsorship that's where sponsorship works. It's not just about a flash in the pan where you're trying to get everybody on YouTube to look at this guy's helmet cam that says Red Bull on it. That's not what a sponsoring a sport is about. It's about believing in it from the early days, putting in, you know, it doesn't have to be that kind of money. It could be spread out. That could have been 20 years of sponsorship for grappling. You know, the people, they just, they didn't, I think, you know, they do it for a flash in the pan and not to really help build a sport. And we're looking, we're still looking for that, that, you know, those mega sponsors that will get it. So, yeah, I had, of course, I mean, any, any business owner, I think, hits frustration points in their life. Um, but, you know, part of it, part of it for me was being hurt for so long and not being able to train like I used to. So my, you know, my heart, your heart falls, you know, um, in, 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 you know, that, that's a challenge. So you have to, when I was healthy and started being able to train again, that changed everything for me. And I started seeing that, you know, guys at the gym were telling me that they were going through challenges and, you know, and, and that it was not just expensive for tournaments, but they couldn't afford the travel. And I'm sitting there going, man, like there's, you know, there's some more serious issues in the world right now than just running a million tournaments. Like, so that's when I kind of switched my gears and started going to help other people because I, I really thought that, you know, at the time, I still do, that, you know, sometimes your greater calling is to help others and until you realize that and change it in your life that you're not really – Otherwise, you're just running on a treadmill, you know, trying to – a lot of people you know, a lot of people just try to become successful just to buy more things to f- try to make themselves feel better about themselves. And it doesn't work. You know, never would, never could. So, I, you know, I went to – my goal came out to say I wanted to reestablish who I was and refine my center first. Um, and that's – I took – you know, I took off the first part of the year – my wife is finishing up college, and I'm, you know, very proud of her because she worked really hard to to do this, and it's something she always wanted to achieve in her life. So, I stepped back into a parental role, which has been wonderful. The the personal development time that I was able to do made me a better father, a better husband, better son. You know, that's the important stuff in life, and you know, all the other stuff. Grappling is is my is definitely my core focus career, but there are more important things. In, in the world when it comes to sacrificing your success for your family life. And people deal with some really tough issues these days. And I, and, and I'm just trying to help in the ways I can. That's awesome. And that, that sparked a, a, a couple other things uh, as far as questions when you were talking, but uh, you, you said something about the taking off the early part of the year, uh, centering yourself, finding what's important now, during this time, uh, I know there was a lot of rumors flying around about Grappler's Quest being shut down or they're, you're not doing any more events for the year. And, and uh, were you surprised by the amount of outreach? Like people were literally, uh, you know, people were, were really into doing a tournament this year. Were you glad with the support for Grappler's Quest when you, you did have your nice little break? It was very, it was very nice. It was frustrating to see what happens with irresponsible media outlets. Correct. And you know that that was a frustration. And you see, like, they, people people utilize sometimes they they create 
you know, it's all fake, man. You know, I don't know how to say it. Like, uh, 90% of the shit that happens out there is fake, and people just like to blow it up, like, for the other 10%, and that is 100% real, and it makes it silly. It's just like they, people, people sometimes do things. I originally wrote a very, very rough, like, like letter against the, the media and grappling and BJ Dix. I was frustrated. I just couldn't believe, like, uh, no one picked up the phone and called me. Nothing, nothing. Going to, like, going to prints, going to the presses, you know, Grappler's Quest dead in the water, Titanic, you know, going down. Like, come on, guys, you know? Yeah, I um, read it all. You know, I, I like, listen, we had some weird weird stuff started going on in my life when I started supporting the anti the, the, the vaccine awareness and uh, working with the Monsanto project and, and you know, bringing awareness and shedding light on what the heck's really going on in the world. That's when weird shit started happening in my life. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of things... You know, when you get you get threatening phone calls, you get you have industries that are angry at you. You're not 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 just some guy, some you know some guy that's pissed off at a, a referee call. I mean, I'm talking industries that, you know, we've done a lot of investigative work on and found out a lot of stuff. And when we started reporting it, uh, you know, started receiving very harassing stuff. So me taking a break, you know, and and recentering myself was also a self defense mechanism to find out what the heck was going on why we were, you know, why I felt like I was being threatened, um, you know, and, and then take care of that too. So I'm not, no, no one knows, you know, no one probably ever will know those stories, but you know, it, there's, when you get any, any time in your life, people need to remember this, any time in their life when they go out there and they are dying to be, you know, have some sort of spotlight put on them in their life because they think like they'll be happy when they achieve that. And then when people know who they are or whatever, and they built something, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that comes along with that too, that I think a lot of people are, you know, realizing or maybe not realizing that happens. And, you know, so there's, there's a lot of weird stuff, man. When you, when you play around with the world and you start being honest about what you're really seeing and you start maybe even standing up for what you believe in, all of a sudden um, things start happening and things that never happened before, you know, and it just, you know, it's just frustrating. As, a, as an American, I felt very frustrated that, you know, it was okay for me to receive threatening phone calls and weird, weird shit like that that just was unacceptable. And you have a family and you're looking out for them. I mean, you become, you become like a, you know, a gatekeeper for your own property, you feel like. So, you know, there's weird shit going on in the world, and that's what people need to realize is that there's a lot, there's a lot of things that we don't understand that the veil is – you know, is, is going to be lifted shortly, I think, for a lot of people that, um, you know, they don't even know what's coming. That's the, that's, that's a, the bad side of the, the, the backlash or bad stuff coming from you doing good. But there's other stuff that, that you're doing uh, that I don't think would cause any problems with, uh, you know, you do a lot for mental health. Uh, you donate to autism uh, for a long time now. You have reliefs for when there's big hurricanes or or storms. And and as a company that doesn't generate the the money that a lot of other companies go to, uh, what made you want to actually donate uh, funds that you have? What, why did you get into these type of, type of things and and not just uh, worry about oh making every dollar back? Well, anytime I think anytime something has a personal connection, that's I, when I when I speak to people about finding their cause, it's because no matter what you do commercially successful, if you're not helping other people, you're not fulfilling your true I think your true destiny in life, your true promise to your maker in a sense. So I believe in in getting finding cause. I, you know, autism became very important to my family, my nephew who ironically today, I mean, when he was, he was a year and a half old and he had his vaccine booster and within five to six days, he lost 60 words of speech. And, you know, for the last nine years, my brother, you know, has been pioneering the, the autism world. And I basically believed in him and supported his efforts and, you know, wanted to see, I saw what my brother's challenge were. And to a small degree, 
and to live with that all the time, um, you know, and challenges that, that just a lot of people, there's something like an 80, 85% divorce rate in families with autism. And there's a big difference in the spectrum of autism. Like you can have a child who's just um, has an amazing memory. They'd be like, they're amazing, a couple different photo, photographic memory. And they'd be considered back in the day on the autism spectrum more towards Asperger's. But then there's, on the other level, there's children that are completely nonverbal. And to have a nonverbal child as a father, um, it destroys a lot of the, um, hmm, how do I say it? it it's sad. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but the, it, it's, it's just part of the most emotionalization of helping people through it. it. You actually go through like a little death um, of what you thought your child's life was going to be like. And, and so what we did, you know, when I saw what my brother had gone through, and then my brother helped me when, um, when, when my son was um, uh, diagnosed on the spectrum as well. He helped, like, coach myself and my wife into getting us on the diets because it changed him. He wasn't severe. He was just on the he's softer, I would say probably closer to Asperger's, and he just had an overactive mind. And it was food linked. My brother's diet assisted him in calming down. He started sleeping again. Um, he got into a special program. And you know, he's doing great. You know, my brother's son is now 10 years old. And today, today actually, that we have this interview, he said two words at school. And the school got so excited because Jonathan's been nonverbal for nine years, eight and a half wow. years. They, they called him home and called the family. And everybody's like, you know, celebrating almost because it's huge two words is huge that's um, amazing that's really touching to hear um yeah so my, my brother so, well, i'll tell you what he did was he wrote a song that was like a poem and we worked it together you know i i have a lot of connections in in the, in the music industry and i we got it we ended up getting a song produced to help verbalize the emotional pain that a parent and child go through and today actually was the release of the Spanish version. I mean, there's 61% Spanish-speaking population in America. Um, I've been traveling around around the world. I mean, there are you have to understand, there's countries that ch- that children with autism they'll chain them in the basement, like literally. There's 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 world countries in the world that the parents have no idea what to do with the child with autism, and they chain them to a tree. So. Like my outreach program starts in America, but we plan on going throughout the world because it's really, you know, it, when you actually know somebody with autism that's severely autistic, doesn't have the verbal capabilities, you know, wakes up the parents by stomping on their head in the middle of the night, like not in trying to hurt them, just trying to be with them because they're wide awake. Um, it's a different world. It's a different world. So when it touches you, ask me why, you know, how I picked this cause is um, one, I believe that, you know, I believe that the neurological disease is that the diseases and or afflictions, the neurological afflictions are linked. I think, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and um, autism and depression and, you know, all these things I think are, are clinical that may, may not be yet to be that they found 100% of the link. But a lot of the research we had done, you know, showed that a lot of it was environmental related. Um, that some could be, you know, people were experiencing triggers and responses from vaccines. Um, you know, the vaccine court, if you, ever, you guys ever do the research, vaccine courts were made uh, I'm from, I'm from uh, I live in, in New Jersey, and there's this company with American Cyanamid. They're out of uh, my hometown. And they were the ones that first brought, they said, to, went to the federal government, they said, if we don't get, if you don't change something, we got, we lost 16 and a half million dollars in a vaccine damage case. If you don't change something with the law, we're not going to make your vaccines anymore. You can go get them from China. So the United States freaked out and they created the, this, this court that limits the payouts of vaccine damage to, um, to patients who, I mean, kids are killed from a vaccine, you know, reaction. And the maximum payout is 250. Not that it's about money. It's just sick, sick that they actually quantified it. Um, 250 thousand dollar payout for for any sort of vaccine inf- um, reaction. So they that, knew it. Crazy. They knew it. They they kind of said it. And we're just now, you know, figuring out the pieces of the puzzle of what the heck is really going on. 
yet everyone's still getting vaccine vaccinations every single day. And, you know, I just, I don't know. I just, I don't, the research I've done and, and a lot of the conversations that I've had with really smart people <laughs> lean towards, you know, spacing these things out and more testing on the individual, uh, the individual uh, treatment, you know, the actual things inside them. You know, they're doing things like, you know, I know this is off subject, but I want you to know, like, literally they're growing things on, like, like uh, chicken fetuses and weird things that you're like, what? You know, the DNA is getting crossed and then injected in. Um, uh, let me write to, and speaking of DNA altering, it let us write to Monsanto, which has been another, you know, major, uh, the big weekend. This weekend is May 25th is the big march against Monsanto. Uh, worldwide at 2 p.m., and everybody's supposed to do something, you know, do something and at least educate yourself about what's going on. Um, and I actually uh, helped I, I, with the team to, to help write the national anthem for the March Against Monsanto. So we did, we also did a little side project while I was, a lot of people thought I was off, <laughs> taking off. I was working on a bunch of different things. Um, the movie The Greater Good is, um, it's a vaccine documentary that I helped with some of the marketing and, and promotions of their, you know, people that are trying to change the world. That's who I've been trying to support. And uh, now I'm back to grappling because I missed it a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I have an event this weekend where it's emulated it, and uh, I'm just looking forward to getting back in the saddle and, and doing what I was you know, destined to do. Well, I, I find it quite amazing that you, you've taken two of your passions and and linked them together and found a way to, to help out causes that you strongly believe in and, and affect your life personally. Um, for the people listening, uh, it, how can we get more aware and how can people donate to, to this great cause? Uh, well, the, the, main, the main site, I'm very um, – a lot of people – that want to learn about the diet, the treatments, the emotional support. Uh, the first family support uh, autism radio network was developed in 2007, and it's streaming at autismradio.org. Um, if people want to make a direct donation, they can go to autismdonation.org. Um, and, you know, it helps. It's 100%. The awesome thing about it is it's a 100% volunteer organization, 5013C. So, it's, you know, there's just charities out there, and I'm sure you've probably read about it. It makes you sick. When you got charities that are, have multiple employees making five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year. And you know, I'm, all for, I'm all for being paid well. That's cool. But when it comes to a charity, you know, uh, that's pretty ridiculous, where that money could be really helping families and stuff. So this charity, uh, Autism Radio, is 100% volunteer. And they recently just started the... Um, they just got approved for the national with the Special Olympics to, to develop the first national swim team for autism. So it's just open to autistic children. And they they launched a pilot program in, in Wayne, New Jersey at the Fayette County Technical Institute. I mean, you're, you're talking there's there are people out there that can help. And any little bit, um, if they download the song, um, the, the, the song uh, Hope Saves the Day on iTunes, um, if the 99 cent download and 90 cents of it, you know, nine cents goes to uh, iTunes and 90 cents goes to autism. So if anybody, you know, is interested in, in hearing a really, anyone knows somebody, it's a beautiful Father's Day gift as well. It was written by my brother and uh, it's awesome. It's in Spanish and English um, and they can download and find out information on that right through autismradio.org. Uh, for upcoming tournaments, um, they can visit uh, grapplersquest.com. We have a lot of upcoming events um, and a lot more planned for next year as well. So a lot of good stuff coming up. Uh, if people want to, um, and also tell them, uh, if people download the uh, the March Against Monsanto National Anthem, I believe it's uh, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y uh, forward slash organic broccoli. And it's called Organic Broccoli. It's, uh, Logan John Lennon is the artist. And it's fun. It's it, it's going to be sung worldwide at 2 p.m. Um, this May 25th, and it's got like it's 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 cool to be a part of it. I'm glad that people are. I, I like to see when people stand up for what they believe in, and 
just can't be afraid, man. People are people are so afraid that they're you know when things happen, you realize that you're doing the right thing. That's kind of when things happen. Things don't happen to people who live average, ordinary lives. And you know, it just I say just stand up for what you believe in and follow your heart and your cause. Whatever you're doing in life, success or or you know whatever charity, whatever your your cause will come to you and it'll be called to you. And people just need to listen to their hearts and things that are real to them, not just get on board with something because they're trying to raise um, you know, exposure for their brand. It comes across – I coach people on this on a very, um, a very high level on selecting their, their charitable cause because it is very important. It needs to basically be in the vein of the brand. And uh, you know, for us, uh, autism definitely was that. Um, speaking about – um, you know, mental health awareness is super important. I mean, there's, they're not reporting it. There's like 40,000 suicides in 2012, and this year is on pace to do 50,000. People are coming home from the military with post-traumatic stress disorder. They're getting, they're afraid to go on medications because the, the U.S. government's taking away weapons from, from even, you know, you have people who are former, who served our cu- country, defended our nation. And because they come home and they're on a medication that they're not allowed to have a gun anymore. So it's just a very, it's a very, very weird time. And I work with a lot of people that really need the help because I really don't think the system is set up for, for what's coming. They say mental health, uh, mental illness itself. Um, I think it's more of an affliction than an illness. I don't like to think of anything as a disease because it makes it feel like it's unbeatable. Um, but the, uh, you know, the challenge of it, they say by 2025, it'll be the number one cause of death above obesity and uh, heart attacks and all that. So it's pretty astounding to say that that's only like 10, 12 years away. And at the rate we're going now and the fact that they start, they stopped counting suicides two, three years ago kind of shows you that America's petrified because the rate's so embarrassingly increasing every month, every year, that we are falling apart. And it's a psychological breakdown that people just can't deal with. A lot of people don't know how to deal with the stress. And, uh, you know, it's just a, I think something, something has to change majorly. And I just hope that people realize that it's, it's, you know, there's people that are called crazy out there. And I think it's, uh, Dave Chappelle said it very well. It's dismissive. And it's, it's one of the, you know, one of the, the weird, just because you don't understand something because somebody's brain works differently. Um, that they still should be treated the same way. Um, some of the most beautiful creative minds in the world, Albert Einstein to Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy, all suffered with various types of depression and challenges. Um, it's, I think it's, our systems are set for a certain level of um, success in life and, and exposure in life, and sometimes things break. And when you, you know, that's where I, I look at it is I think by talking out about it, you show people that it's okay to feel. And we got so far away from our human emotions and became computers. And we became our iPhones. We became our iPads. And we got away from the human interaction. So um, when I set out to, you know, I've had several clients of mine who I've had, you know, coach them off of the uh, bridges. You know, and, it, and when you do something like that, it changes your life. When you, you, do, you realize you saved someone's life, you realize that you shouldn't be afraid to speak about something that could save people's lives ever because what are we here for? You know, no one, you know, usually, like it's sad to say, like suicide is usually such a, it's ever like that's a bummer to talk about. Yeah, you know what? It's a real bummer when your best friend or your 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 wife or your brother or something terrible like that and, and that occurs not to say that happened to me but i'm just saying i've coached people that it has you know and their life is is uprooted at a moment so you know for for helping people not have to have their life uprooted to to not lose a wonderful soul on this earth and for people to realize that their life is you know there's suicide is usually a really really terrible fast solution to a temporary problem and our management skills emotionally have to be have to evolve people get too upset about little shit excuse my language but they get too upset about little things and then when something huge happens they completely lose it they completely fall apart so 
And I think it's all about uh, life. Life is, you know, your your pursuit of happiness. You know, we've been given the, the opportunity with the pursuit of happiness. There's no guarantee of happiness. We have to find it ourselves. We can't find it in someone else. And, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a message of getting people to realize that they need to take responsibility for their own emotions. Wow. That, that was deep, and, and I respect what you're, you're saying. And uh, I'm glad there there's someone out here in our community linking all these things. And, and you know, you're making them – uh, hand in hand with your donations and your awareness month and your blogs that you've been putting out. So, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, you get a lot of people, uh, backing you and, and, and working with you. Uh, it seems you, you do have some help. So that's a uh, great news to hear. Um, you, you answered a lot of my questions when you're talking, but I was wondering now, uh, that we've talked more, I get to see how you are. How important is it, you were saying it has to be uh, in the veins of the brand, uh, how important is it because, uh, you know, myself running a company and my friends, that you don't just have someone hand you money just to have their logo on your website or to be part of your, your company, uh, how important is it to you to team up with people that, that you actually believe in or are are good? Has there been times where you've turned down a, a large sum of money just because you don't actually believe in the brand? Yes, there has been. And there's been a lot of times when I went, I didn't go category hunting because I didn't necessarily believe in the health of the product. Okay. Um, I don't know, you know, it's hard to, it, when you're in that position, like it's such a, it's such a shitty, you know, walk. It, that's, you've got the companies that you know, that have the most money usually have the scariest chemicals inside the products, you know, like, I don't know, like it, it was happening a lot of times. So we, you know, I'm very selective. I have to believe in the, in the company that's sponsoring us because I research everything. You know, if, if somebody's using, you know, a red, a red dye number 40, you know, like it just doesn't make sense anymore. It causes cancer. We know that, you know, like I, I like responsible brands, but, I'm also, you know, in, in business, in business, you know, it's, you, you can just go different categories. I think it's category jumping and realizing that there's, there's car companies out there that need to be in grappling. There's insurance companies. Um, you know, there's, there's in, endemic and non-endemic brands, like the sports brands, like Armors, Adidas. I mean, Adidas played around in the, in the kimono market, but I mean, they didn't do anything to sponsor and they never really supported the sport per se. And it, that always frustrated me. I always said, you know, Adidas has a gi. Like they believed in it enough to actually build a gi. And then now they're just like pussyfooting around and just dealing, they're not sponsoring events like they could, like they should. You know, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, we want to, for us, you know, when you get a company like a huge, you know, I don't know, whatever. I don't want to say a brand and crush myself, you know, but like, you know, these, some, some of these things are, are sugar filled, like, you know, liquid crack and I don't believe in it. So I gotta, you know, I am researching every single time we get proposals. Yeah. You know, I say no all the time. People hate me for that. Cause I say no all the time because I, but I have, I've said no to people that wanted to buy our company. You, you sometimes you got to say no when you're the owner of a company. So you have to do it's where you, you wear your big boy CEO pants and you can't, you can't, you know, you have to make tough decisions sometimes. You know, I've had I've had team that uh, a team a long time ago that ended up coming back and supporting our events, but boycotted our shows because they were um, they slammed somebody in a competition, and I wouldn't reverse the call, so they wanted to you know to stop supporting my events uh, based upon that. You know, it's weird stuff like I'm not. Like mob moves like that, that just nothing like that works for me. That nothing works like that. I would never. You cannot bend your integrity when it comes to safety or, you know, your moral beliefs. It's just so. Yeah, I I say no a lot, and I am I'm probably you know I'd be very careful to. I'd work with people and other people that wanted to come on board and you know be our partner and help us go big, and it it didn't carry. You know, they if it was. You know, the kids grappling on a Bud Light mat, it was okay. You know, I didn't, I just was like, ah, I don't know. You know, maybe we could have a certain mat. You know, it just doesn't, 
I got to, there's a lot of moral decisions where we're at this young level of the sport that a responsible owner needs to make. So yeah, I have to say no a lot. Okay. Now for the people coming up, uh, do you think it's also important to, to have quality over quantity and, and, and what if that hurts, uh, the outcome of them being able to produce a certain quality of show or produce an X amount of events. Do you think it's worth taking that loss opposed to just going out and throwing logos recklessly everywhere? I, I think that I think that if you look at I, I never want to say take money out of the athletes' uh, pockets. That you know, but I also believe that like the athletes are sometimes not it's it when it becomes NASCAR, you know, NASCAR works because they drive in a circle and <laughs> that all angles of the car can be seen. But when you're sponsoring a fighter and you have you have sixteen logos or twelve logos on them, you're hoping that the camera stops and like sticks on one part. And it's hard. It's hard. It's it's a real hard thing. But now the the UFC had set a pretty high um, precedent to, you know, I believe the sponsor one of the events. It's, it's pretty substantial to get your licensing approved to be able to have your brand showcase at the UFC. Mm-hmm. So, you know, guys aren't able, like the logo soup isn't happening anymore, but, and then you get the brands that are like in it and you have to be in it to go spend $150,000, $100,000 to, to get your brand out there. So you're getting your, your thing out there and, you know, you're, you're, you got to sell a lot of shirts. You got to have another, you have to have a distribution plan. You have to have wholesale reps and, and sold in OTM fight shops and, you know, and other, you know, and have, have a deal with fight planet in Canada and, you know, and sure dog. And, you know, like you have to be smart. People, people just would flash money around these brands come and flash up and then they disappear. And everybody's like, what happened? And what happened? Well, they were irresponsible. They didn't, they didn't have a plan. So I believe that if a sponsor who's inside the mixed martial arts, and they would they would want to be very loyal, at, you know, at an, an affordable per event price for anywhere from like a two to three year period. That's what I think the to get your brand in front of enough faces that it becomes the brand. You know, it's the fightwear brand or a sports label that wants to make the official T-shirts of the tournament for a few years you know that they should want to i've been making them myself for years now for the ufc fan expo i think we're having montu montu is going to be making the shirts you know there's a brand that gets it they understand they understand i think it's montufight.com is their website they sponsored they're they're the only sponsor of grapplers quest you know at the at the ufc fan expo inside that area like that's our sponsor so we get one sponsorship that we, we were able to move. They are, they are a loyal company. They're head instructor. It's going to be the head. Uh, our head referee is one of the owners. And, um, yeah, man, you got to be loyal. you got to be loyal to the people who, who are there for you, and you, know, you, you do it back for them. Respect. Uh, the, you know, you guys were actually the the first people. I didn't even know there was such thing as super fights in grappling. Uh, I was at the uh, UFC Fan Expo in Boston. I believe it was uh, 2010, and I got to see Cyborg and and Rolls Gracie, and he had the nasty exactly. knee bar. And uh, I think Ryan Hall did a, a path to the back take during this event, and uh, uh, Tracy Goodall fought, and uh, it, it was that was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Uh, as far as that, that really uh, turned the page for me uh, as a fan of grappling, not just competing. I would show up to events and never even watch them. I, d- I didn't grasp it, but that was the first event that really changed my shift as far as uh, falling in love with the uh, event. Uh, I was wondering that what your you favorite. Uh, oh, you lost you for a second. I was wondering uh, what your favorite matches were. Wow. My favorite match. I would say my fa- one of my favorite matches of all time was Bill Cooper versus Gregor Gracie. And then and that was huge. And then the last that was in 2006. Um the Marcos Avalon versus Pablo Popovich was a great one in 2004. Mar- oh, Lehman versus Gracie. That was that was epic. I mean, that was like 
you know, we had all these special rules that, that, that the Horian wanted. And, you know, it was like we negotiated really hard. <laughs> and then he cr- created this big media, like this like fake media storm just to mess with Mark's head uh, the day of the event. And, you know, on the mat was there. I remember Scotty was interviewing everybody. They're on, they're on YouTube on livegrappling.com. But they, it's hilarious just to see it, like to actually see where we were back then and uh, how far the sport's come. I mean, my, my favorite match, I would say the most exciting match was probably the Marcel Mafra versus Bill Cooper match from the last UFC Fan Expo. And uh, that was you – know, when, you, when you get the, the intensity, and I think the rules are now changed with the submission only. And, you know, like we're doing – you know, you mentioned Darson, and that's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu submission only match. You know, very few, you know, that's the submission uh, for super fight wise with our, you know, 10 minute, no, no points submission only. And then the five minute grapplers quest rule never been done before either. So I'm excited about that to happen um, this, this coming weekend in Canada. It's just, we get so many opportunities. We, we have, we have the opportunity to change the sport in little ways to make it better, to get it on the biggest television networks in the world be able to showcase this in front of millions of people with huge sponsorships, huge cash prizes. It's all in the future. It's going to be bigger than X Games. That's, you know, it, it's there. It's going to happen. Amazing. If you don't mind, I'd like to just ask uh, one more thing. Sure. All right. I was wondering, you have Grappler's Quest Hall of Fame. Uh, was this always an idea of yours? And, uh, just to let the people know who's been inducted and and uh, without giving too much away about coming up, uh, who will be inducted, uh, what, what do you have to be to become a, in the Grappler's Quest Hall of Fame? Well, I think the you – know, Brandon Vera said it best. Grappler's Quest is not a stepping stone in mixed martial arts. It's part of it. So guys that have taken the quest – and taken, taken and started with Grappler's Quest and realized that they built their, you know, they, they built a lot of their competition. Um, they removed a lot of their competition anxiety. And like guys like Greg Jackson, Diego Sanchez, um, you know, you know they, they, were, they were, had thousands of matches to coach, you know, Greg Jackson, thousands of matches to coach at Grappler's Quest because he would come out with a team of 80 to 100 guys They'd have four or five matches each. I mean, he got coaching experience, you know, beyond what he thought was possible. He said it in his induction, uh, you know, interview, post-interview. And, you know, I would say that, you know, Ricardo Laborio is in, uh, Rafael Lovato Jr., um, guys that have, you know, gone and won. You know, you can get, you can get somebody at the end of their career, uh, but I believe when they've, when they've achieved the highest level there is, um, there's, you know, they, they need to be com- commemorated somehow. Um, and there's uh, Kurt Pellegrino uh, was was inducted, Joe Daddy Stevenson. Um, let me see. The names are uh, uh, Gazi Parman was the first female that was ever inducted. Um, Salo Hibero was inducted. Um, these, are, these are big names. Yeah, you know, I mean, listen, and the guy and guys that literally stepped into stepped onto our mats, not just like it wasn't just like um, you know a bunch of commemorative awards that were just thrown out to make an instructor feel good for the day. We went out and got people that were, you know, that were that actually started with our organization and went on to do something huge. And I, you know, put a lot of time when we induct somebody, I put a lot of time into what I say about them because I know that there's, there's a feeling, there's always a feeling for me to say, you know, it's like, it's like not that big of a deal. Like, I feel like it's like, it's such a great sport, but no one makes that big of a deal about it. And even see like Fila, like dropping grappling, like that was disgusting. Uh, I I saw that. It was a terrible, terrible thing. I mean, first of all, they didn't, they didn't run the sport. And they, even though they acted like it for years, I mean, but they, you know, they did a very, they, you know, tried to get, they flew us out to Colorado for USA Wrestling and to work with them. And it just never, it never really got off the ground 
And all we realized what they wanted was membership cards. And people, you know, they thought there was two, 300,000 competitors, and they're like, hey, multiply that times $25 each. That's, that's a lot of money. So instead of looking at sport building, they just looked upon it. They just wanted membership. And I'm a sport builder. So I don't think we actually need all these organizations. I don't think we, you know, and, and you know, some, organi- some, some or, you know, provinces might need, you know, or states or whatever, you know, countries might need an organization um, because of insurance purposes or something. But if it's beyond that, um, this is just some political embodiment that helps make it a political mudslinging. It's just, it's terrible. I, everything, I'm very, very, I like researching history. If anyone looks at Julius Caesar and, you know, a lot of the other empires of the world, you know, empirical organizations always end up falling apart. Um, they they upset everybody long enough, and sooner or later, um, the straw that breaks the camel's back, and things change in a very very quick way. And you know, you have to be you have to always be aware of that, and that's why you have to always improve. You can't just sit back on your, you know, your your scare tactics or, you know, charging people $450 for their school so they can sign up under their own academy. It's just, it's silly stuff like that that I think in the long run will break down those organizations. And unless they change, you know, it's all about the money. It's all about the money. That, all right, at least we know it, but it's not. It's about the sport. And I think right now with that opportunity, that opening showcase to get the sport uh, into the world, the world stage again. That's my goal. My my goal is to get us to you know it's going to be bigger than it, was, it can be bigger than the Olympics because you know what even the Olympics had judo on at 3:34 a.m. and no one saw it. It was ridiculous. So if they were going to throw grappling at 4:47 a.m., you know we didn't want that anyway. That wasn't what that that was another just a slap in the face and trying to get you know a bunch of big sponsors and. And we got to make it so it's at 8 p.m. on ESPN and, or on Fox Sports or Spike TV or, you know, or Fight Now with a 25 million people audience, you know, <laughs> you know, potentially, you know, getting a one, two million people to watch your show. That's what we need. And Absolutely. then the sport will change forever. I respect that. Uh, we're running out of time here. I was just wondering, uh, anybody wants to get a hold of you, uh, I mean, there's grapplersquest.com. Uh, now's your time also uh, to, to, you know, thank people that help you uh, plug anything you want. I mean, this is this is your show here. Well, I appreciate that, man. I well, listen. We have our our sponsors that really stuck with us were uh, Super Body Care. Uh, Cherry, uh, she she launched her company at a Grapplers Quest in 2006, and she's a hundred hundred percent essential oil based. Uh, you know, products that naturally keep you antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral properties. Um, I've had, you know, people that used to use, like myself included, dandruff shampoo, that all I use now is their walnut scrub. Um, <laughs> Frank Trigg had a funny, uh, you know, it, Frank Trigg said it's like, he's like, I take half hour showers now. Like, it's funny, like, it's, it, it's a great company, great product, but they've actually been there in the sport for seven years. So, Super Body Care. Dot com. I, they're going to be in stores worldwide and very shortly. A lot, but right now they're available online, spelling in some stores. Um, and then uh, uh, MontuFight.com. Montu, uh, my good friend Alberto Marchetti, the head Grapplers Quest referee, uh, has been a big, big supporter for us for years. And um, you know, I mean, we've had there's so many there's so many people. I, Eric Zippy has been our photographer, been working with us for years. Um, uh, Yak Productions. Just uh, world-class people. We built a family with Grappler's Quest. Um, my my brother, the guys from the Ontario Grappling Alliance, Rohit Seth, Alex Rohit's Ro- um, the man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, guys, people that literally have they've sacrificed part of their life to help build the sport, and that means on the side of Rohit uh, Rohit's truck, the OGA um, truck, it says the spirit of grappling. And I realized that that was what the sport needed. And, and it, you know, you get further away from the spirit when you focus more on money. And the spirit of grappling will never die when you're around amazing people like those guys and people who, 
who actually realize that we're here for something a lot greater of a cause than just our life's uh, financial gain. And it's not just for the sport, not just for our fan. We're here for a lot of greater causes. Uh, those are the people I surround myself with. I had a great talk yesterday with uh, Scotty Nelson from On the Mat. I hadn't talked to him in a while. Um, you know, I have I have been in the sport as long as anybody, and I have you know seen relationships come and go. I saw that you know when when you're super busy, uh, managing relationships is really hard. I don't think that I was probably the best of friend to a lot of people when I was in my workaholic mode to build my brand. Um, but my real friends, the people that are really there, they understand. They understood what I was building. And they didn't hold it against me and, and make me feel bad about wanting to make a difference in the world and to make my mark on the world. So, you know, real friends, I'll say that the people you get successful in your life, you get busy in your life, you know, keep – my father told me you need one good friend in your life. You need one good friend. It's all you need. Um, he said because, you know, when you're, when you're dying, you know, you're sitting around. There's only a couple people that can stand around the bed, you know. It's a different way to think about it and a different way to, to realize that it doesn't matter the quantity of friends. It matters the quality, what quality of life you put back into them and ultimately how we get out there and help other people. That's, that's the way I was taught, and that's, I'm going to stick to that the day I die. <laughs> you know what? Let's end it on that that great quote and uh, you know life advice. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, you know what? I would love to have you come back on the show maybe in a a little bit once uh, some other stuff start kicking off for you and you have some more announcements. Uh, you, you are great to talk to. Uh, I I want to thank you personally. I'm a fan of Grappler's Quest and and not only just uh, Grappler's Quest. You know, at the end of the day, it's about people promoting jujitsu. So. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, without people like you, there'd be not people like me. There'd be nobody. Uh, you know, you're one of the first people to do it. And uh, thank you. Seriously, I really appreciate anyone who's out there promoting jujitsu and 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 trying to get grappling uh, to the masses. I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate that you are giving us. You know, there's the media. You know, people, people like the Alex Jones of the world that, that went on and you did, you created your own media source where no one, you know, no one else was doing it. Uh, regular, you know, radio shows are few and far between. You know, mixed martial arts shows, they'll only talk about one thing. You went very specific, and I think it's cool. I think it's very cool, and it gives us an opportunity to have a real conversation, and you're shining a light on the sport that I love. So thank you for everything you do for the sport, too. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk soon. Uh, this was an episode, and, and thank you once again. Thanks, man. I'll talk to you soon. Good luck this weekend. Thanks, brother. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to uh, Bidget Jack Radio. Don't forget to tune in next week. Uh, we'll announce the guest uh, midweek. And then the week after that, we have Stefan Kesting on. And uh, that's it. Let's wrap this up. 90 seconds. You heard it, 90 seconds, folks. Hang tight. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye.